Hello students, this is Dr. Ways, and welcome to your lecture on the urinary system. All right, first of all, we want to talk about surface anatomy and the position of the kidneys uh, relative to the outside of the body. So notice that the left kidney sits slightly higher than the right kidney. And the reason for this is due to the size of the liver that also sits on the right side. Um, uh, creating a need for more space so the right kidney uh, moves down slightly. All right, in the posterior aspect of the uh, patient or the human, uh, the kidneys are protected by ribs 11 and rib 12, more so in the left kidney than the right kidney, which is only uh, protected by rib 12. All right, so when you assess for kidney tenderness, you're going to be doing maneuvers that involve the costal vertebral angle, angle costal vertebral angle, uh, or CVA. And so that's what this angle is right here. So the angle that the 12th rib forms with the vertebra, um, you will do some percussion maneuvers that will allow you to assess uh, kidney tenderness. And that would be for the left side and for the right side as well. All right, so also notice that the uh, hilum of the kidneys sits at about level L1, so the first lumbar vertebrae. Some more notes about renal position. Notice uh, again, that, and we've talked about this, that the kidneys are retroperitoneal, so they are behind the parietal peritoneum on the posterior abdominal wall. And when we say they're against the posterior abdominal wall, we mean they are against the muscles of the posterior abdominal wall. So if we look at this picture right here, we see, <coughs> excuse me, that the kidneys lie behind, or in uh, actually anterior to the transversus abdominis muscle, the quadratus lumborum muscle, as well as the psoas major muscle. So it's not like your kidneys are directly against the skin. They are uh, underneath a sheet of muscle uh, uh, that off also offers some protection. All right, and again, they're protected by rib 12, and the left kidney, slightly higher, is also slightly protected by rib 11. And remember, these are our floating ribs because they're not attached directly to the sternum, so their uh, kidneys are protected by our uh, 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 floating ribs. And this is another picture just showing you that the kidneys, uh, uh, the retroperitoneal nature of the kidneys behind the peritoneum that is associated with these different organs. Um, that you don't have to know those, but they uh, will help identify where uh, the kidneys are actually located. So we're looking at this as if this is an anterior view, which is why this is the right kidney and this is the left kidney. And also you notice the left kidney is slightly higher. Uh, another thing to note is that the ureters are also retroperitoneal. So as they travel down the abdo abdominal cavity, they are traveling down posterior to the peritoneum. So again, they are retroperitoneal as well. All right, the kidneys themselves have this bean-shaped structure, all right, as you are probably already familiar with. And of course, the ureter is coming out of the kidney. Um, and the blood supply going in would be the renal artery. Blood uh, coming out would be through the renal vein. And the lymphatic drainage goes to, uh, as it says here, lateral or aortic lymph nodes. So lymph nodes uh, to the lateral side of the aorta, each lateral side of the aorta. All right, also notice from this picture is that the kidneys are surrounded by fat as well. So... Uh, not only do you have uh, these muscles right here that are protect that are between the kidney and the outside wall, uh, the, uh, the skin, but you also have these layers of fat which help to cushion the kidney uh, also and keep it uh, in place. You'll also find a lot of fat if you uh, look at a kidney in a gross dissection, a lot of fat that is right in this area too. In fact, you know a lot of the kidneys you see, including this one, uh, you see all this detailed structure because the fat has been cleared away, and that's kind of a long, laborious process, but the product you get at the end is kind of cool looking. All right, for the specific structure of the kidney, here you have the 
uh, renal cortex, this area right here, uh, all the way around. And then everything inside of that would be the renal medulla. Cortex meaning outside, medulla meaning uh, the middle. And you'll see that concept played out in a lot of anatomical uh, specimens, uh, organs, if you will. So within the medulla, uh, actually go back, within the cortex, that's where all of your glomeruli and the filtering apparatuses are going to sit. All right, and then in the medulla is where your nephron loops, the ones which help concentrate urine, uh, are going to be located. So uh, the cortex, we can't see any more structure grossly, but in the medulla, we can see that we have these renal pyramids, and the renal pyramids are primarily where those uh, nephron loops are going to be located, <clears throat> as well as collecting ducts. In between each one of these pyramids, we have renal columns. All right, renal columns, and you notice that there are blood vessels in those columns. <coughs> Excuse me. At the tip of each renal pyramid, or the apex, you have what's called the renal papilla. All right, and the renal papilla is important because that's where all of the collecting ducts, where the stuff that's going to become urine, uh, actually at that point it is urine, is going to empty into these spaces, these smaller spaces called uh, minor calyces. All right, calyx is singular, uh, calyces would be plural. Calyces. All right, and these minor, minor calyces will then coalesce together to form a bigger group, which is called a major calyx. All right, so here would be a major calyx for these minor calyces. And the major calyces come together to form this area here called the renal sinus. All right, and the renal sinus will then empty into the ureter, and the urine will travel down to the urinary bladder. So the inside part's called the renal uh, sinus. Outside, where the ureter is enlarged uh, and contains the renal sinus, that's called the renal pelvis. All right, so from the outside, it's called the renal pelvis. From the inside, where it's a like a funnel, it's called the renal sinus. All right, and I think sometimes those can be used, and uh, people use them interchangeably. Where the renal artery is going in, renal vein is coming out, and ureter is coming out, that is known as the hilum of the kidney. And remember, we saw hilum in uh, the spleen previously, and we also saw hilum in the... Uh, lungs previously. So again, that is a generic term for an indented region of an organ where you have blood vessels, uh, nerves, lymphatics, and other structures such as the ureter here uh, going into and or coming out of the organ in question. Here again would be the kidney. So just a couple other things to notice about the kidneys, especially in relation to uh, blood supply. Uh, notice that with the left kidney here, uh, the renal vein heads out of the kidney and goes underneath or posterior to the superior mesenteric artery. So the superior mesenteric artery uh, folds over the left renal vein. And also notice that the renal artery is posterior to the renal vein. So if you're looking uh, at a cadaver, or if you're doing surgery on somebody, the renal artery will always be behind the renal vein. And you see that this is also the case on the right side. The renal vein sits in front of the renal artery. And that's an important uh, thing to take note of. All right, so obviously venous return follows arteries, uh, just to uh, make a note of that. And then lymph drainage also follows arterial supply. So um, the drainage of the kidneys is going to, no matter what it is, arter or venous or lymphatic is going to follow the uh, arteries. As far as innervation goes, we have these splanchnic nerves going to the kidney, and we've talked about those uh, in previous lectures. And also we have a renal nerve plexus, all right, a group of nerve fibers that have come together and recombine to specifically go to the kidneys. And remember, since this is an organ, uh, the nervous system innervation is going to be sympathetic or parasympathetic uh, in nature. And what the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system's role in the kidney is, is to 
uh, constrict or dilate blood vessels, which will aid in glomerular filtration. It can exert some influence on the reabsorption or secretion of substances within the tubules, and it can play a role in the renin angiotensin system. You remember renin comes from the kidneys as well, so it can uh, help control the release of renin from the, from the kidneys. As far as sensory neurons go, the kidney itself does not have any sensory neurons, but the capsule that surrounds kidneys does have a sensory component. And when the kidneys are uh, getting bigger, whether it be due to disease, whether it be due to swelling, uh, like hydronephrosis, uh, the kidneys will stretch that renal capsule and that will cause pain in the kidneys as opposed to the kidneys being pain themselves. All right, so the kidneys do not feel pain, but the renal capsule that surrounds the kidneys is capable of sending pain signals. The final thing I wanna mention about this slide is that as urine is collecting in the renal pelvis here and traveling down the ureters, there are certain spots within the ureters where there are constrictions, all right? And so there are three constrictions. Uh, the first constriction happens at the ureteropelvic junction, so where the ureter and the pelvis, uh, renal pelvis, come together. So that's the first constriction. And the importance of mentioning these is uh, that could be, those could be spots where uh, uh, urine could back up, or if the ki or, uh, kidney stone is being passed, these are possible points where uh, the kidney stone can get stuck. All right, so that's the first constriction. The second constriction is at the pelvic inlet. All right, so you're going into the, the pelvis here and notice that you are right between the external iliac artery and the internal iliac artery. So that constriction is going to be right there between those two uh, iliac arteries. And then the third constriction is where it's entering the bladder. In fact, as it's going into the bladder, it kind of goes at a, an oblique angle into the wall of the bladder so that the bladder uh, actually sits on part of the tube and as the bladder fills up it actually shuts that so it acts as a valve but it is also a constriction point so a place where um, uh, re renal calculi, renal stones can uh, get lodged. Sitting on top of each kidney uh, you will have this uh, pyramid-shaped gland called the suprarenal gland or the adrenal glands. Uh, suprarenal means on top of the uh, renal or on top of the kidney. Adrenal means next to the kidney. Um, so they're roughly pyramid in shape, sit on top of the kidneys, and you remember the adrenal glands are the only glands, or the primary glands rather, where it, steroid hormones are secreted from, all right, the renal cortex. And then in the renal, renal medulla, you have the, I'm sorry, adrenal medulla, you have catecholamines, epinephrine and norepinephrine, all right? Since these are endocrine glands, uh, you are going to want to have a nice blood supply going to them. So the blood supply comes from and you notice uh, this sits just above the celiac trunk, the superior suprarenal arteries, just above the celiac trunk, the middle suprarenal arteries coming out at the level of the superior mesenteric artery, left and right, and then the inferior suprarenal artery, which are branches off of the actual left and right renal arteries. So just above the celiac trunk, at the level of the superior mesenteric artery and branching off about halfway between the aorta and the uh, kidneys along the renal artery. All right, as noted, the adrenal veins follow the arteries to the inferior vena cava. All right, and remember the inferior vena cava is right here, slightly to the right of the uh, aorta, which is uh, running centrally. Uh, sympathetic fibers, uh, of course, those chain ganglia from T8 to L1 uh, go to the adrenal medulla. And the adrenals get drained uh, lymph by lymphatics 
uh, to these uh, lumbar lymph nodes. So all the lump, lymph nodes that are grouped in the lumbar region, that's where the suprarenal glands will drain excess fluid to along lymphatic vessels. All right, so now we've made urine with the kidneys, we've transported it down the ureters, and now we're getting into the uh, next part of the urinary system, which is the urinary bladder. All right, and just for sake of clarification, whenever we talk about bladders, may, please make sure you're referring to urinary bladder or gallbladder, because both of them have the same you know, name bladder in them, so we want to distinguish what we're talking about, whether it be the um, urinary bladder or the gallbladder. So here, the urinary bladder, the ureters come in, and like I've said before, uh, the, as they're coming in, they kind of go at an oblique angle to the muscle of the urinary bladder, and uh, that kind of forms a flap so that when the bladder fills up, it presses down on the area that the ureter, where the ureter is ent entering and kind of closes that off so you don't get reflux of urine back into the ureter going up to the kidney because that can cause uh, all kinds of problems such as uh, back, um, urinary tract infections that have traveled upwards uh, to the kidneys. All right, so you don't want reflux to happen at all. All right, where the two urinary, I'm sorry, ureters enter the urinary bladder, uh, and then where the urethra exits the urinary bladder, form kind of a triangle, all right? And that triangle is called a trigon, all right? So it's just a uh, area within the urinary bladder that's formed by the uh, openings for each ureter as well as the urethra. Notice that in the empty state, the urinary bladder has all of these folds in them. And we didn't talk about this with the uh, stomach, but those folds are called rugae, all right? Rugae. And the, what the rugae allow the urinary bladder to do is when it fills up, it gives it room to stretch without tearing the mucosal layer within the, uh, the urinary bladder, all right? So... If you look over here, what we see is an empty bladder, and then as the bladder fills up, this is um, the space that it will take up, all right? And as it fills up, these rugae kind of flatten out, and you have a, a smooth surface. I've done enough uh, cat dissections in my career to know if I open up a cat and it has a really small urinary bladder, that has a lot of rugae in it, I know that it died with its bladder empty. But if it has a big flappy urinary bladder, I know that it died with its bladder full. Okay, so uh, definitely a big difference between uh, what the uh, anatomy of a uh, empty bladder looks like versus the anatomy of a full bladder, urinary bladder that is. The urinary bladder is held in place anteriorly by the median umbilical ligament which is a remnant of a structure that was present during fetal development. And then the muscle surrounding the urinary bladder is known as the detrusor muscle, the detrusor muscle. And of course, when that, um, the urinary bladder fills with urine and it stretches out that detrusor muscle, of course, that sends signals uh, that will eventually result in signals coming back to the detrusor muscle to begin its contraction, and that's what gives you the feeling of urgency that you have to uh, urinate. As far as the urethra goes and the muscles that control uh, emptying of the bladder, we'll discuss that when we discuss the male and female uh, reproductive systems and how the urethra uh, fits into uh, their anatomy specifically. All right, the arterial supply to the urinary bladder comes from branches that feed off of the internal iliac artery. And the main branches that we're concerned with are the superior vesicle artery and the inferior vesicle artery. All right, so vesicle, 
means uh, bladder. So that's just another word for bladder. So a vesic vesicle or vesicular artery uh, would mean the bladder artery or the artery going to the bladder. Uh, as such, the venous drainage corresponds to arterial pathways. So you will have ves vesicle veins going to the internal iliac vein or veins, if you will, because you have a left and a right side. Lymphatic drainage is as stated here to the external and il internal iliac lymph nodes, uh, which we'll see uh, later on. Uh, and we've already shown before as well. And the innervation come from to this uh, urinary bladder comes from sympathetic fibers, T11 to L2 or L3. Uh, there's some variation in that between people. Uh, to the pelvic plexuses, uh, as we've seen before. Uh, parasympathetic from the pelvic splanchnic nerves to inferior hypogastric plexuses, which we uh, have also seen in previous lectures. So uh, if you want to remind yourself of where those are, go back to the organs of the abdominal cavity as well as the accessory organs of the abdominal cavity to um, and look at the pictures associated with that. So just as an introduction to what we're going to be covering in the reproductive uh, lectures for male and female, uh, the urinary bladder empties into the urethra, all right, and the urethra is the uh, tube that extends to the outside of the body through which urine is voided. And the urinary, or I'm sorry, the urethra, uh, it opens in the same spot for both females and males. But the difference is uh, the urethra for females, much shorter, urethra for males, much larger, and uh, goes through several different pieces of anatomy before it exits the body, as opposed to the female where it just is a direct exit uh, out of the body. And uh, some of those uh, structures are related to uh, reproductive purposes. For example, uh, the urethra is not only a path passageway for urine, but it's also a passageway for sperm and semen. So you have glands along the way, such as the prostate, as well as the bulbo gland that will secrete substances into the urethra, along with things that are coming from the vas deferens, uh, from the seminal vesicles, as well as from the testes, uh, and they will travel the length of the urethra as well as the urine. So what goes with that then is that we have different parts of the urethra, the preprostatic part, the prostatic part, the membranous part of the urethra, and the spongy part of the urethra. All right, again, we'll be discussing that in the reproductive lectures. So this is just another view showing you the urinary bladder in a female and the urethra opening to the vestibule of the female uh, between the labia majora and labia minora, uh, just anterior to the uh, vagin vaginal canal. And, but the male, here's the bladder, and then it has to go through the prostate, then it has to go through the perineal membrane, and then it has to go into the uh, spongy tissue of the penis all through the spongy tissue of the penis and out to the tip. So definitely a much longer uh, path to travel than you would see in the females. And uh, one of the reasons why this is important is that because of this short distance between the uh, opening of the urethra and the bladder, females are much more susceptible to uh, urinary tract infections because it's easier for the bacteria to uh, propagate along the small urethra and get into the bladder than it would be for uh, bacteria to propagate up the male urethra given the distance it has to take and the number of uh, curves it has to go through along the way. The other thing I want to mention about the female uh, urethral opening specifically again here's the vagi vaginal opening and here's the urethral opening uh, anterior to that um, and I've taken care of patients, and in, in a nursing field, we catheterize patients, and we have to find where the urethral opening is in females. And 
during embryonic development, that urethral opening can get placed in any number of locations uh, within this general area. So uh, generally, no two women are gonna be exactly the same in where their urethral position is going to be located. And then that will also change uh, with childbirth and as a woman ages. So uh, just something to keep note of. Uh, males as well, um, there are all different sizes and shapes of penises. In fact, one uh, patient that I had to take care of, I had to clean, he had a catheter in and I had to clean his catheter and uh, his penis was an any. It was, uh, he was a heavier set gentleman and his penis and older and his penis was uh inside so i had to push uh, fat pads away and you know pull it out in order to be able to see where the opening uh to the urethra was so i could actually get in and clean the catheter so you're going to see all different kinds of anatomy uh, with the urethra uh, in both males and females females being a little bit more difficult than the males are to actually locate.